Good. So I again, I think that just that just kind of shows that like the um, what things are like where when you take proverbs like this and you look at them, it, it's always good to say, okay, where else in the Bible does it talk about these same principles? Because then it's just going to you know broaden out your understanding. Okay, so I thought it was, was good because when we think about diligence, then there's we're, we're, there's part of stewardship, right? To be a good steward in our lives and the things God's given us is very important. So in stewardship, Proverbs talks about finances, speech, and relationships. So those, those are what we're going to talk about next. And so when it comes to stewardship, I think this is a great verse for stewardship in Proverbs. Proverbs 27, 23 through 27. Know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. So a couple things. So know... That says know the state of your flocks, but how could we relate that to our lives? When it's saying know the state of your flocks. Just the people you know. Okay, good. Know, know what you're doing. Know, you know, your relationships. Like, take them into consideration. Think about them. Um, know what's going on. Could be with your job. Could be with people, whatever. And put your heart into caring for your herds. What if you don't put your heart into what you're doing? Again, it's not going to work out. And again, in the New Testament, it talks about in whatever you do, do it as to the Lord. So that's putting your heart into it, right? If you're doing whatever you're doing as to the Lord, put put your heart into and in caring for your herds, like caring for people, caring for things, caring about what you do. For riches don't last forever, and the crown might not be passed to the next generation. What what does that mean? Good. And so in our day and age, we could have a recession, right? Gas prices might go up. <laughs> so anyways, um, just a realization that being a steward of the things I have today should help me think about preparing for the future, whether it's relationships, whether it's finances, people, you know, whether I have their relationships, finances, and speech. And speech yeah. Okay, um, after the hay is harvested and the new crop appears and the mountain grasses are gathered in, your sheep will, be, will provide wool for clothing and your goats will provide the price of a field and you will have enough goat's milk for yourself, your family, and your servant girls. So I think I, I like this proverb because it is clearly talking about <clears throat> being a steward of the things that you have, right? And so when we think of stewardship, you know, the first is... Um, is finances that I have on here. And I think with finances, one of the things that I um, think is super important is to go to think about, when you, again, when you're going through these Proverbs and thinking of the principles, what it, first of all, what did Jesus say? Or did Jesus say anything about these specific ones? And so if you go to Matthew 6, 19 through 24, we'll look at that in a second. But Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in the spring. I mean, clearly we know like trusting in money isn't isn't the answer. Now money can bring security. It, there's a lot of verses that I printed out there that talk about having wealth and the things you get from it if you work hard. So it's not a bad thing by no means. Uh, but don't trust in it. And then I think um, I think it's fitting to look in Proverbs um, or look at Matthew six. Does someone want to read Matthew six nineteen through twenty four? Someone have time? Want to look at that quick? Yeah, I've got it here, Ben. Okay. <clears throat> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. Uh, Twenty-four. Sorry. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Okay, good. So I think we probably all remember that verse pretty well. And so instead of maybe even just finances, we could put like material things or wealth. Uh, but but what it's all again it's always good to look at okay this is what Proverbs is saying but this is what Jesus is saying about this too and so in this everyone seeks some kind of treasure and that's I think that's just the way it is right your treasure will control your heart whatever controls your heart controls your behavior so ultimately in our day and age this is a big deal how we are stewards of the things that God's given us and especially materially well, I was thinking that it's a bigger picture where, say, you get involved in some kind of pyramid scheme or something. It, you're not only trying to get, you know, greed pulls you into it. Then you get into it trying to make more money. Then you may compromise trying to, to stay where you are. Yeah. And then you compromise uh, your Christian walk. So it's it just... Which, which, that's a good point, because again, then where is your, ultimately your heart? And so I want to read something, and it kind of goes to your point, where it might start out well, but then ultimately, how, Lord, how, help me, you know, the, the prayer is for us, Lord, help me to guard my heart when it comes to material things. Um, because we don't want our hearts to be controlled by what's earthly, right? We want the treasures to be in heaven, not here. Mm-hmm. Right, that we want to put put for that. So part of the stewardship. So just real quick, a backstory, and this is the same guy that that uh, wrote this, Paul Tripp. So he, th- there is this guitar that he had always wanted, and he was at the guitar store, and his mom he he told it he called his his parents called when he was at the guitar store, and they bought it for him. So it's very special for him because it's one that he had always always dreamed of having. But then uh, his wife, it sounds like, was having a, like, you guys have probably played the game, like, if there was a fire in your house, what would you go grab first? And so, you know, I'll, I'll read this. I think it's interesting. Uh, shortly thereafter, Luella held, the, held her fire safety talk around the dinner table. She turned to me and asked, Paul, if a major fire broke out on the main floor of our house, what would you do? Without a moment's thought, I responded. Um... I would run in the living room and grab my guitar and get out of the house. <laughs> so you can see, where is this treasure, you know? I will never forget the look on the faces of my family as the silence that seemed to last about a year. Finally, one of my children asked, what about us, Dad? <laughs> my embarrassment and shame was deepened by the look on Luella's face that asked the same question. And this is kind of what you were saying. The guitar in the music store had become a dream. The dream had become a purchase. And the purchase had become a major treasure capable of rearranging my priorities in a fundamental way. And that's super important for us to think about. Like something that maybe started out well, what has it become? Right? We rarely say, I'm going to set my heart on the things or we rarely say, I'm going to set my heart on the thing and let it completely control my life. But that is exactly what happens. So when we think of treasures, when we think of finances, when we think of those things in our lives, we're not setting out thinking, yeah, I want this to control me. But oftentimes that's what happens. And so what he says here, this is, this is great. It says, the person you met and mildly enjoys or enjoyed becomes a person whose approval you cannot live without. The work you undertook to support your family becomes the source of identity and achievement you can't give up. The house you build for the shelter and comfort of your family becomes a temple for the worship of possessions. A rightful attention to your own needs morphs into a self-absorbed existence. Ministry has become more of an opportunity to seek power and approval than a life in the service of God. The things we set our hearts on uh, never remain under our control. Instead, they capture, control, and enslave us. This is the danger of earth, earthbound treasure. And I think that's so good because when it comes to treasure and when it comes to the stewardship of the things we have, it's easy for us to let it kind of get away from us, right? And so I think, you know, as we're thinking about this, 
if, if we're letting it get away from us, what are we looking to? What are we trusting in? And so as it begins to slip, we need to say, Lord, help us not to be, become something in my life. And for me, one of the things I love, I love motorcycles. And motorcycles are something that I can turn into, my wife knows, lots of stories. <laughs> like, I've bought and sold and had all kinds of motorcycles in my life. And it's one of those things, like, it's, it, be, it can become something that can really quickly consume my mind, consume my thoughts, because I like working on them, and I like riding them, and I like buying and selling them. And so all of a sudden, the, motor, the idea of having a motorcycle to ride around and enjoy creation becomes, I just get absorbed in that. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with that, but and with us, you know, like the work, we, the job we started 10 years ago now is my identity. Those kind of things that I think uh, are part of that. So all this to say, um, I think it's, it's one of those things that finances for us is a big deal. Now I want to show you this video. This um, and it kind of, it's interesting because it's it's a little bit older, but it gives a good idea of like where people are putting their finances and maybe you've seen it. But let me see if I got sound here. Jesus told us two thousand years ago that our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. He also promised us that only after we accomplish that task will we receive the blessing of his return. So, how are we doing accomplishing our mission? To answer that, let's classify the 7 billion people on the earth today into three groups. Let's start with the Christians. About 33% of the world's population would identify itself as Christian. We call this segment of the population World C. C for Christian. It's important to remember that not all of the people that fall into World C are true believers in Christ. They merely identify themselves as Christian because of nominal belief in Jesus or because they live in a country where everyone is considered Christian, so they would do the same. Next, there's the 38% of the world that has access to the gospel but has chosen not to follow Jesus. They have Bibles in their language, churches nearby, friends or coworkers who are potentially Christians, or access to other Christian resources in their language. These people have access to the good news, but just haven't acted on it yet. This segment of the population is called World B. That leaves us with 29% of the world, just over one out of every four people on this planet who not only have never heard of Jesus, they have no chance of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. They have no access to the gospel, no Bibles, no churches, no believers nearby, no chance to learn about Jesus. We call that 29% World A. Now on to missionaries. Only one out of every 1,800 Christians in World C decides to serve as a cross-cultural missionary. So, we can pull 400,000 missionaries out of that World C population. That's our total cross-cultural missionary force worldwide. Did you know that 72% of all our missionaries are going to World C? That's right, the vast majority of the missionaries being sent out are going to the people of the world that have Bibles and established churches. 25% of the missionaries are sent to World B, where there is already some access to the church and to the Bible. That leaves only 3% of the total missionary force to handle all of World A, the section of the population without any chance of hearing about Jesus. 29% of the world has no way to hear the gospel, but we're sending only a tiny portion of our Christian workers to them. What about finances? Annually, all those Christians in World C earn a total of $42 trillion. And together, they give about $700 billion to Christian causes each year. That includes everything. Christian nonprofits, churches, youth programs, missions, etc. Can you do the math? Less than 2% of Christian income is being given to Christ's causes. Out of that $700 billion given to all Christian causes, only $45 billion is given to missions specifically. That's a little over 6%. In fact, there is more money reported embezzled from the church each year than is given to missions. Remember those 400,000 missionaries? We have $45 billion to support them and their cross-cultural work. But how exactly is it allocated? Well, $39 billion goes to World C every year. Yep, 
87% of that mission's money is being spent in areas of the world that have Bibles and churches available. 5.4 billion, or 12%, goes to World B each year, those that have access to the gospel message but have rejected it. That leaves only $450 million, or 1% of all missions money, going to World A, the least reached people of the world. To put that into perspective, annually Americans spend more money on Halloween costumes for their pets than get sent to World A. To summarize, only 3% of our missionary force, armed with only 1% of missions giving, is going out to reach the 2 billion people who don't have access to the gospel. 2 billion people are still waiting for the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's a question for you. What are you going to do to change that? Okay, so now I teach at a missions Bible college, right? So I'm not trying to get your money. Right now. <laughs> but I think it's a, it's a good point of when, when we're talking about stewardship and finances. You know, it's, it's a good kind of an eye-opener of, okay, when we think about the Christian population, you know, what, again, and I'm not trying to um, really make too much more of a point other than, you know, what are we doing with our money and, and the things God's given us, and how are we being a part of God's plan and God's <clears throat> eternal purposes in the world? And so ultimately we know that's through the church, right? Like the church is where it starts. And so what are we doing in our own church in regards to missions and ministry and giving? And so when we think of finances, though, and that's a great illustration of, man, there's a lot. There's not much going to a lot of people in the world that, that don't have it. And so, again, it's just a question of stewardship. And that question of stewardship based on the New Testament is answered, right? Where can you guys think of that is talked about finances in the New Testament? Can anyone think of it? Okay, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And there's a few principles in there about giving, right? And giving... Cheerfully. Cheerfully, good. Giving not out of compulsion. So it's not one of those things like you're you're, um, someone's trying to force you into giving, right? It's something that you desire or want to give to. And it's interesting in the, New, in the Old Testament, and I won't get into this too much, but the tithe was a tenth, right? But the tithe was for the, the priests and the temple and all that stuff. So now, who, who's the temple of God now? We are. We are. So mm-hmm. we should give to ourselves. That's what I'm thinking. No, that, wasn't, that wasn't my point. But ultimately, we are. You're right. But in our, but according to Paul and the Corinthians, there, we are to give to. And Paul wouldn't have been able to do what he did without churches giving to him. And some of the churches that were struggling in that day wouldn't have been able to be sustained unless other churches were giving to them. And so it's very clear in the New Testament that giving is a huge part of the church. But there is no, and again, I don't know, Josh can correct me if I'm wrong, but in regards to the difference between the tithe and giving today, ultimately I think it comes down to what you believe, what you believe God wants you to give. Because I don't think it's, it's designating a percentage. And, but it goes back to stewardship. So if I'm a part of God's eternal plan of the world, and I see myself as part of a church, how does my giving, how, how am I accomplishing the things I believe God has put on my heart and put on my church in regards to being a part of his eternal plan around the world? And so th- that, that's kind of all I wanted to say. Like, there's much more. We could talk about finances a lot more. But I just think, like, again, when you're reading Proverbs, compare it to what, is, what, what other verses in the Bible talk about giving. And how do I know how I should give? Because it's important for us to have a biblical mindset of giving. Um, I always liked what I always thought was a challenge that God is putting forth to us in Malachi um, chapter three, verse ten. Yeah. If I may read that, just yeah, you can, yeah, you can read it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. 
and test me, God says. Now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Yeah. No, that's, that's good because it's one of those things that's tied to... It, it's, it's hard because like I get that verse in the Old Testament, I think was it was specific for... There was a uh, conditional covenant on the nation of Israel that their obedience would automatically receive blessing. And so, with, but in our new covenant, you know, it, it, there's a similar obedience there, but it's, it's different in the sense of there was actually, God actually told the Israelites, if you obey me, I'll bless you. And that's where we get the prosperity gospel thing. So I know you're not saying that, but, but it is... But it is one of those things where in this day and age, again, when you look at the New Testament based in the Corinthians passages, ultimately that, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm giving because I believe this is what you have. And it is. I think at times you can say, okay, Lord, I don't know. But that, to me, that's a compulsion thing. You don't want to give, you don't want to give out a compulsion in the sense of like, or, or out of if I give, then somehow God's going to repay me. Because the blessing you're going to get may not be a financial. Like, you may not win the lottery that week. Right. Oh, okay. But it's it's what you're saying in regards to, but there is a blessing. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a blessing in some way, shape, or form. I have an example from last Sunday. I went to um, the grocery store, and I picked up some things for uh, a cookout. And I went home, and then I got a phone call saying, you wouldn't mind going back to the grocery store with you and getting more things. Well, I'm driving back to the store and going, Chase, that person that called a little earlier, I wouldn't have to make the second trip. Yeah. Okay? So, you, if you accept the fact that God orders your steps, then, um, so anyway, I got there, and this time, the second time, um, there was a woman with two babies, and she was asking for some money to help her for some food. And so the Lord, I felt the Lord say to give her something. And um, then as I was driving home, uh, the Lord showed me that my heart wasn't right about complaining about having to go back because there's always a reason for things. And I yeah. feel like she wouldn't have had my contribution if... Yeah, so the Lord blessed you in your mind as you... As yeah, you like, yeah, that's good. And that's, I think, you know, what you're saying, like the Lord. And sometimes there is... Financially, I've given, I've given before, and that same day the Lord has given me back, you know, too. So, but anyways, we could go, the finance thing, Josh will have to do a Sunday school on finance sometimes. Because <laughs> it is interesting, picking all those verses and thinking through that. But again, taking the New Testament passages and comparing it with Proverbs and finances, there's a whole bunch of stuff on finances there. <clears throat> okay, the power of the tongue. So the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap their consequences. So the thing is, when we think about the power of the tongue, where else in Scripture does it talk about the tongue? And, and ultimately, just in short here, um, I think it's super important for us to understand the tongue is power. When we think of power, think of your tongue. And it's power to give life or it's power to destroy. And so how are you using your tongue? Is, is your, is, are you characterized by your speech by giving life or by destruction? And I think it's, because when we think about it, gossip and slander and flattery and all those things are based on destruction, right? They, they bring destruction. Gossip brings destruction. Flattery can bring destruction, right? Slander, all those things. And your tongue is a great <clears throat> show to yourself where your heart is, according to what Jesus says. And so your tongue can also give life, encouragement, the words at the right time, kindness, making a phone call, writing a letter, whatever it is. Your tongue can also be, it's a stewardship. Am I, do I see it as I might, I need to breathe life into somebody. And I can breathe, breathe life into someone. I can be an encouragement. I can be kind. And so when, when you think of the tongue, anger is part of that too, and discipline, right? If I'm undisciplined, it's going to affect 
if I'm not diligent and lazy with my tongue, what is going to affect things as well? So Luke 6.45 I'll just read the bottom part. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, what the heart's saying, again, this is Jesus again, what I'm thinking in my heart comes out of my mouth, right? Uh, Matthew 15, 8, same thing. But the things which proceed out of my mouth come forth out of the heart. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt, or another translation, unwholesome talk or word proceed out of your mouth. But that but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the ears. And this is pretty self-explanatory. Let no corrupt word proceed from my mouth. Dirty jokes, you know, certain things in certain contexts. Um, and so again, I don't want to get in too much because ultimately this needs to be, Lord, if I, is my speech, do I have corrupt speech? Am I... Do I have unwholesome words? Because I don't want to sit here and judge um, what exactly that is and make a dictionary of what you can say and can't say. I think it's more between you and God, do you know that the words coming out of your mouth are bringing edification? Or are they, or, are they destroying? <clears throat> and again, I think of it like this. As believers, we are like superheroes. You have power because you have the Spirit of God in you and you have the Word of God, and you have other believers. You have more power than other humans on this earth. And what are we doing with that power in our speech? Because we can bring life, or we can destroy. And so Proverbs 4, 24, avoid all perverse talk, stay away from corrupt speech. And then as you know, in James, and this would be a good one to read this week, James 3, 3 through 12, it gives a whole description of the tongue, and who can tame it, and who can bridle it, and how it's it's a, a force to be reckoned with. And so the main thing in Proverbs, I think it's super important. You can categorize kind of everything else in, in Proverbs regarding speech as you're bringing life or you're bringing death. And so I think that's where um, the tongue is, is important. Okay, relationships. If you're not impacting people, you're not impacting eternity. I don't know who said that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. The only thing that lasts forever are people, right? So if people aren't something that you are making a priority in your life and relationships aren't something you're making a priority, then ultimately, how well are we impacting eternity? And so it's one of those things when you, when someday when you're up in heaven sitting on your deck, <laughs> And you got all your buddies around you. You can look around, and and I think you'll be able to say, "Yep, you know." And I think you'll know. I have no idea how you're gonna know, but <laughs> but I think you're impacting people, and I think people. Hopefully, we can go around and be like, "Hey, thanks for being part of my Christian life down on this earth." And so someday, when you invite everyone over that you've impacted in your life. You know, what, and again, it's not a, I'm not trying to say a comparison thing, but like, I just think that there will be a day when you will know of the people that you have an impact in their life. And it's probably a lot more people than we think. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, just like the, the lady you impacted at the store, hopefully we understand, you know, relationally, our relationships, again, our stewardship. How am I doing with the relationships I have today, Right. And so what I think is interesting in this that's very important because it talks about your neighbor, right? Being kind to your neighbor. Proverbs has a lot of neighbor stuff. So we don't have time to read that passage, but what do you think that passage in Scripture is? What, what parable is that passage, you think? The Good Samaritan. It's the Good Samaritan passage. Very good. So the Good Samaritan, Let's. I'll just read the last verse because I think that that is where again as we think of Proverbs like how what who exactly my neighbor is this answers that question it says now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits Jesus asked the man replied the one who showed him mercy then Jesus said you go and do the same so the neighbor according to Jesus is the one who showed him mercy so ultimately, that's speaking to you, 
and I and everyone we interact with are considered neighbors according to, the, according to the Lord. Because it's the one you show kindness to. It's the one, it doesn't, it's not an actual person you can think of, oh, this person's my neighbor. It's whoever you have opportunity that God puts in your path, right? And so who's my neighbor? So, And the, re- the reason why I say that is because your neighbor's, as we think about this, expand our view a little bit on who my, who my neighbors are. So, think back to that video. Those 29% of people in the world who have no opportunity to hear the gospel, are they your neighbors? Are they someone that we, as people, need to say, I'm going to do something about that? Now, I don't know exactly how, but Lord, I want, I want to do something about that. And so what can I do about that? People in our community here, that you know God has given you certain gifts and abilities to help with. Lord, what can I do about that? And again, it's not a guilt thing. It's a, Lord, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Help me be a good steward of the things you've given me. So in relationships, I don't have, we don't have time to go through all these different things. But uh, being a steward of our relationships, uh, there's a lot of verses that talk about how to reach out to your neighbor. Uh, don't put down your neighbor. Show yourself friendly. You know, be loyal, keep their confidence. And again, these are all basic interpersonal things that we know. Be sensitive. You know, there's that verse in there about don't be too happy in the morning because it'll annoy people. I don't know which one it is, but (laughs) there's some funny ones in there about, you know, Proverbs that has. But it's all in there. And then handling disputes, um, be tactful, defend those who can't defend themselves. I think when I think of abortion, I... I think that's a great verse, Proverbs mm-hmm. 24, 11, and 12. Um, you know, just like we can we can be a part of that. And I actually, when I think of people who have no chance to hear the gospel, I think of that verse too. Like, what am I doing to help those people that can't help themselves? What am I doing about that? So again, when we think of stewardship, these are all, all stewardship things. And I think it's super important, and we talked about it last week a, l- a little bit, is it's super important that we see people as spiritual beings because they're spiritually going to be die and be separated from God forever or they're spiritually going to be with God and us forever. So if we think of them as spiritual beings, that's where in Ephesians where it says we re- wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. So in other words, when we think of each other, we shouldn't look at the things that offend and annoy. We should say, that's a spiritual being, and because they're a believer, I want them to grow and understand the Lord better. That, that should be my focus to another believer, that they grow and understand who God is and grow in a relationship with God. To an unbeliever, what's my purpose? That they come to know Christ. So th- that removes any kind of stigma, any kind of feeling, any kind of thing, that if they are not a believer, I don't care what they did to me, I want them to know Christ. Right? If they're a believer, I don't care what's going on or what's happening in my relationships, I want them to grow in Christ. And that puts you in the right place when we talk about humility, seeing yourself the way God does, because then you're seeing your neighbor the way God does too. And that's super important for us. If we want to have good relationships, we have to humble ourselves and see them the way God sees them. And God thinks they're pretty awesome. Right? And God thinks you're pretty awesome. And God thinks the unbeliever needs to come to know him. And so we need to see that too. So I think it's good when we're talking about, you know, relationships and interpersonal relationships. Okay, so God's guidance in my life. So again, in Proverbs, if we look at the, this thing, I mean, we, we can turn to different things about God's guidance or God's will. And, um, you know, the one that comes to most of our minds, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understandings, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. Um, there's different ones. A, man, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. You know, we all have read that one before. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Commit your actions to the Lord, then your plans will succeed. So again, it's a principle. Every time you commit your actions to the Lord, does it mean everything's going to work super smooth? No, but ultimately, whose plans will succeed? His. 
So one of the one of the verses about God's guidance is Psalm 37. You guys probably remember that. Look up Psalm 37. It says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will do what? Give you the desires of your Give heart. Give you the desires of your heart. And you know why? If you delight yourself in Him, your desires will become His desires. Other way around, His desires will become your desires. And that's why you're. That's why you." See that because all of a sudden the things that you thought were so important maybe aren't that important, and so those, those are things when we think of God's guidance. Um, think of this. So the illustration here is not your party, and when you think of when you think of that as good, like if I were to go to Jack's birthday party, and at Jack's birthday party we were all there, there was presents and everything, and Jack was uh, there ready to blow out his candles. And you saw me over there opening his presents. <laughs> and then I quickly went and blew out his candles and <laughs> took a bite of his cake. Like, what, what What would you guys think of me? Mm-hmm. That's rude. Like, what are you doing? It's not even your birthday, right? Like, that's, that's, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Okay, well, who's, whose party is this? Who's in charge God, of this world? God's party. So when we're doing our own thing, who's the fool? Mm-hmm. Who, who looks crazy mm-hmm. you know what I mean so when it comes to God's guidance it's super important that the starting point is to understand it's all about Jesus right that God's ultimate the story of creation is about people knowing Christ relationally and if we keep that in mind in regards to Proverbs here as God's guidance like that's why the, the plans will succeed is because ultimately it's about him. And I fit into his plan. Now, if I went to Jack's birthday party, brought a present, you may not even know I'm there. Right? But that doesn't matter because who's it about? It's about Jack. And so it's super important in our lives as we understand God's will for my life. You always have to start with the premise. It's not my party. It's God's party. How can I fit in? Whether I'm seen or known or recognized or significant, that's not the question we should be asking. The question we should be asking is, Lord, I want to be a part of this. And so how can I do that? So I think that's, that's really good. And when you think of the story of Jonah, read the, oh shoot, it's 1032. Read the story of Jonah and think about this, because he missed the whole point. Jonah was thinking it's his party. Mm-hmm. Right? And th- th- that's what makes it humorous for you when you think about it. All right. Sorry, guys. We, we'll, we'll miss the, miss the last one here. But I'll catch up next week.